Okay, so let's get started um, here today with another Cosmos OG, um, Zeki Manian, uh, who took the time spontaneously to make this interview, tuning in from uh, California. Thanks so much for taking the time. How's everything going? Uh, it's going great. You know, it's, it's super busy. Uh, everyone in crypto is very, very busy. Uh, and, but uh, happy to be here and a huge fan of all the content that you've been producing. Um, you know, uh, when, when, uh, when we started Prop 34 and a lot of the marketing stuff, one of the, one of the things that sort of, one of the gaps in, Cos in Cosmos was, you know, Cosmos has had a really good presence on sort of crypto Twitter um, yeah. for quite some time. But, you know, the new people who are coming into Cosmos um, or, and coming into crypto, uh, they learn they, YouTube is such a huge component of, of how, they, how they learn about what they're doing. And, you know, Cosmos did not have a real presence on YouTube. And so, you know, we, we, we started with Prop 34, all of this engagement with YouTubers, but, you know, you just sort of organically showed up in the, uh, in the, in the community. Um, and, you know, there's nothing better than someone who organically sort of discovers and has really brought Cosmos to the YouTube community. So uh, to crypto YouTube. And so I really appreciate that. Yeah, I appreciate that as well. And it was truly, truly organic. I mean, when I heard about Cosmos for the first time, I had literally no clue. Uh, and that was like um, late 2020, actually. I mean, I've heard about it before, but I didn't know the magnitude of, um, you know, problems that you guys are resolving and already have resolved. And then Jack Zempelin, who is also, I think, your, your business partner and, and co-founder of also Sommelier Finance that you're also working on, he then really took the time to jump on a call with me back then when I had zero clue and walked me through and, you know, I had him on my channel and that's where I started. Um, luckily enough, that was before the osmosis snapshot happened. So everybody who watched my videos from back then was uh, lucky to get, uh, to get the airdrop, which was pretty nice. Um, but anyway, today I'm really, really excited to have you on um, because I'm also an avid follower of your content and I can't even keep track of all the things that you're doing. It's, it's incredible. Um, uh, but um, yeah, um, on your website, it says that you, um, you graduated from the Pennsylvania University in, in two, 2005 and then after that self-taught yourself everything about engineering, programming, development. Um, and um, then you actually worked for, I think, over 10 years in a traditional tech company. Um, and then in 2014, uh, discovered crypto and really dig deep into that. Started your first blockchain company for enterprises back then. I think it was called uh, yeah. SKU Skew Chain. Or Skew Chain, yeah. Um, contributed on, on Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, and really dig deep into that. So um, maybe we can start off um, by how did you then get into Cosmos? How did you hear, hear about it first? And what was the, the hook that got you really into, into Cosmos? Um, so a mutual friend introduced me to Jay um, back in the, uh, uh, back in 2014, before the Tendermint, before, when Jay was working on Tendermint, but before the Tendermint like, white paper existed for really anyone knew about Tendermint. Um, and I, uh, I found, I, you know, the two pieces of cryptocurrency that really interested me, the technology that really interested me were, um, the things that I liked were protocol design. Um, so I got really interested. I, I, I think I was just early, very, very interested from the beginning. Like what's the most interesting piece of, of this? All of this is, is the fact that you get, that this protocol design stuff exists. Mm. Uh, that you can be a protocol designer. Um, so that that was one piece of it. Um, I got really interested in in consensus algorithms. Um, I think uh, you know, especially back in the day, it was like. Um, and then the other piece was the cryptography piece. Um, so um, and I think you know it was really in 2014. Jay was the best thinker on on consensus algorithms in the space. Um, and people didn't really recognize it and didn't understand. Uh, uh, and it was, it was really underappreciated um, how much his ideas, uh, how, how far ahead his ideas were. Hmm. Um, uh, and it, again, it was just sort of an organic thing where, you know, Jay was like, Jay wanted to build a cryptocurrency exchange and then was like, but people can double spend me. Well, like, I, how can we live with that? 
uh, and, and, and what does consensus security mean? And sort of went down that rabbit hole and really found a way of building proof of, uh, a way that made proof of stake useful. Um, uh, I think basically until Tendermint, proof of stake was never really a serious project. Um, people who were doing proof of stake were sort of dabblers and dilettantes. Um, and, you know, Jay was really the first person to really work on it seriously. And then like recruited Ethan and they met at an event that SkewChain hosted. Um, mm. uh, and, you know, it, it, it was a really, you know, the early proof of stake community was basically a, a lot of, you know, in those early days, you know, uh, uh, Martin Kopelman from Gnosis, uh, Arthur Brightman from Tezos, Dominic Williams, Definity, uh, uh, Jay and Ethan, we all like hung out in like these like in like these little office parks in, in Mountain View. They all lived around here. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody was in kind of this like one place. Uh, and it was that Silicon Valley magic of people who are working on something that like seems kind of out there, doesn't make a lot of sense uh, and turns out to be enormous. Yeah, I loved it. And I had also Ethan uh, here on my channel and he also told me his side of the story and uh, also Vlad Zemfir, I think he was also very early involved in, into that and good friends. Vlad, Vlad and, and Ethan were friends from college. Yeah, right? I love that. And then also, and like, you know, Vlad was pretty well known in the blockchain space and Vlad basically like invited uh, uh, Ethan to come to this event that we were hosting. So Ethan flew in from Canada and that's kind of like where we all got started. That's awesome. And uh, already, like you, you mentioned, um, all these projects that came out of that, right? Definity, huge. Cosmos, huge, right? Uh, Tezos, well, they did better. I think now they lost a little bit of, of their shine. But um, also Hashgraph, uh, Hedera Hashgraph with Dr. Lehman Bird, I think they also have been taking uh, some elements of what you guys have researched and figured out and Jay's uh, findings and, and Ethan's findings and uh, added their flavor to it and built it a DAG out of that. And then you have the Casper network, which just went live also recently. So it's it's funny like how it's all rooted back then in this, like you said, Silicon Valley-like environment and how, how it's all kind of like connected and you guys hung out together. Really, really um, interesting, exciting stuff. Um, but so so you just talk about your early days in Cosmos and I think um, you joined in, uh, was it 2017 or 2018? And you have been also having- So basically, in you know, after 2017, you yeah. know, so like what happened in 2017 was like all of those people who were who, who were kind of just like hanging out and nobody and like really just kind of like, you know, working on this on weekends and in the evenings and like trying to figure out how to make all of this stuff happen. Or, you know, it was just like one or two people working on these projects. Everybody raised just like massive amounts of money uh, in 2017. Um, so in 2017, I was like running around, just like trying to help all my friends um, deal with these massive crypto treasuries that they had built up. <laughs> um, uh, and then in 2018, I sort of, you know, basically every, you know, every one of those projects was like, Zucky, come, come work on our project full time. Um, and I decided I wanted to work on Cosmos um, uh, full time. I wanted to put my energy into Cosmos. And really the reason was, I, I, you know, it was very clear to me that it was gonna take a really long time for a lot of other things to launch. Um, it was gonna take a long time for Ethereum proof of stake to happen. It was gonna be, take a really long time for Definity to launch. Um, and Cosmos was kind of like almost there and they just needed some help to get launch to happen. Um, and the reason I thought launching Cosmos was important is, I really believe, you know, I, I really believe that proof of stake was the future. Um, mm -hmm. And, but up until then, every proof of stake launch was really just like a bunch of either early whales or a foundation or, and it was like, you didn't have any sense of real community. It was like, we launched this algorithm, theoretically anyone can, can run a staking node. But like realistically, really like, especially in the early days, it's all run by like a very small group of insiders. Mm -hmm. um, and like that isn't, was not good for proof of stake. It really like undermined the credibility of proof of stake. Um, 
And I thought that there was a real opportunity because I kind of knew what Tendermint could do um, that you could use cause the Cosmos launch to really convince the world that proof of stake was legitimate and credible. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was what I spent 18 dealing with, which is how to get, how to get Cosmos launched, how to get it out into the world, um, and then how to create a community of validators um, because there was no validator community um, right. when, when I when I came into Cosmos um, to get a bunch of validator the validator community up and running and live, um, and so that 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 was that was the mission of 2018. And you know it was you know it was the test nets. It was uh, building the QA process inside of Cosmos. It was getting uh, uh, it was getting uh, recruiting the validator community. It was doing game of stakes, which was the first uh, incentivized test net. All of those ideas that sort of then like, you know, the, the incentivized test net thing just went crazy um, after the success of game of stakes. Um, and the validator community has sort of evolved in ways that I think are not all that surprising to be honest. Um, uh, but yeah, uh, I think, you know, this is, uh, and I think you know the 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 proof of stake merge uh, for Ethereum is really kind of going to represent kind of what I think we all sort of expected, which was there's going to be one proof of work network, Bitcoin, um, mm -hmm. and then pretty much everything else is going to be proof of stake. Interesting. And before we get into um, all the interoperability protocols that um, Cosmos has already shipped and is still going to ship. So what, what are your thoughts on, on Bitcoin being the only proof of work chain out there? I mean, there's no plans at all to switch to proof of stake ever, I guess, and it's never probably going to happen. Do you think that Bitcoin... Well, okay, so I, I, don't, I don't agree with the never going to happen. Okay. Okay. So I disagree with the never going to happen. So I, I think there's, 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 uh, uh, there are like three possible futures for Bitcoin. Yeah or maybe two possible futures. So one possible future is um, Bitcoin is actually overtaking. Um, I think Ethereum can overtake Bitcoin. I think there's a possibility of that. And I think um, uh, uh, if Ethereum overtakes Bitcoin, that's Ethereum is that, that isn't the end of the story. I think that we're, we, that, the, uh, that there will be a battle for the throne for a long time. Um, I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing for cryptocurrency, um, uh, but it really will show that like it's all about sort of the uh, the on chain economics, the over the evolving mechanism side. Like those are the things that really matter, um, and not sort of uh, uh, Bitcoin's like sort of uh, immaculate conception um, that is sort of the unique thing of, about Bitcoin. So that that possibility is there um, and Bitcoin sort of just becomes just another coin. Um, and that possibility is, is, is an option. And so then whether or not Bitcoin stays proof of work or not, mm. doesn't really matter. Right. Um, the second possibility is, I think if you look at, you know, to the 2030s, Bitcoin really then, if Bitcoin remains a major asset and the dominant asset in, in the cryptocurrency world, um, and the narrative of Bitcoin as this sort of, you know, the, the one, zero to one, the, the immaculately conceived, the perfect sort of origin story cryptocurrency ends up being, you know, what really matters and has durable value. You end up in, 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 this, in, a, in a regime where Bitcoin really has to make a choice. Um, as minting becomes sort of tails off mm. um, in the 2030s, as, as we are many having this from now, uh, and minting starts to tail off, this whole idea of, oh, you can use transaction fees to, to secure the network is just ridiculous. Like the whole idea is ridiculous. Mm. But if, when you look to the 2030s, there are going to be uh, uh, BFT consensus algorithms, um, uh, you know, Tendermint and its derivatives um, that are going to have been running for more than a decade. Um, 
and running securely for more than a decade, as long as today Nakamoto consensus has been running. And at that point, I think Bitcoiners are going to really have to ask a question. The minting of Bitcoin is more or less done, but does anyone want to use this Bitcoin network to actually settle transactions? Right. Um, and so Bitcoin may end up in a state where, um, you know, there is some tail emission of Bitcoin um, from the network, but essentially no settlement of Bitcoin occurs on Bitcoin. Um, and all settlement happens on proof of stake networks. And essentially from a practical point of view, Bitcoin has moved to a, a proof of stake model um, where, but like the staking is being provided by their coins. Um, and the and the and the Bitcoin network just has kind of withers and dies. Um, and I think that would be fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that's honestly the most likely outcome. Um, where you know, as as the uh, the economic rewards of Bitcoin don't no longer justify spending huge amounts of, of, of energy for tiny fractions of a Bitcoin. Um, and so there, there are some people mining Bitcoin, you know, there, it exists, um, but it is, and like most, bit, most transactions involving Bitcoin happen on other networks. I think that's a fair thesis. Yeah, fair point. Um, especially like, I mean, most proof of stake chains are only active since two, three years, right? Maximum. Yeah. Um, We're still early. We're still, We're still very early, early in proof of stake. So if, if if the system proves itself to one be secure, but on the other hand also to have the right economics to be decentralized enough, then I think um, it might be appealing for for Bitcoiners to rethink their stance. Also, given like you were saying that the inflation of of Bitcoin goes down um, significantly, and they had to cover it up with transaction fees, which would be bad for end users, right? Especially in in countries where they actually should have sound sovereign money. Right, um, they can't afford to pay 60, 70, maybe hundred dollars per transaction. So um, it's going to be interesting. And well, um, you, so it's we're, I think we're really seeing a world where, so you know, MEV has become like a huge, huge topic, um, which is crazy to me because uh, you know, again, like back in twenty fourteen, Jay and I were talking about this, right? Mm -hmm. um, like we've been we, people who people who have been consensus and protocol design people have been talking about MEV um since you know the early days it was obvious to us but i think you very much run into a a, a a a problem that makes proof of work not unstable in the long run which is either you don't have enough transaction fees mm. to or you've introduced mev into the protocol mm. um and mev will cause consensus instability you've been seeing all of these uh uh uh, uh po you know edgar got in all this trouble for sort of publicly building a client that would sort of facilitate running consensus instability, but anyone could build this. Um, and consensus, so, you know, you end up in this situation where you either, the transaction fees are large and you erode consensus stability and like settlement guarantees, which is what you not what you want, or you, uh, uh, or you don't have enough consent uh, fees to secure the network. And it's really unlikely that there will be a scenario where you have, where you're, where like neither happens, where like you don't have enough, you don't have MEV and you don't have consensus and stability and you don't, uh, and you have enough transaction fees to secure the network. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I expect Bitcoin is an asset to survive and Bitcoin is a network to yeah, and I think this also shows that we're still very, very early. And also the public is, is still kind of learning about all this. Um, like you were saying, and maybe you, you were talking about this seven, eight years ago when it was when you were designing those things and already anticipating those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this again, this shows how early we are in the whole space uh, in general, I think. And um, maybe in, a, in another episode, we can focus only on MEV. Um, and also look at how Cosmos um, can or could resolve it. Um, yep. I think Tony also uh, gave a presentation at the, the ETH conference, um, the ETH MEV conference or whatever, this online thing that was a few weeks ago. Yep. But yeah, that, that's yeah. probably something um, that we could cover another time. Um, and also it's very technical. So I will also have to, because I'm not technical at all. So I, you know, I have to get into that <laughs> to be able to... to uh, I think it's just amazing that we live in a world where people even talk know what we're talking about. Like I, 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 I've, yeah. been, I've lived right. in the world where like, 
Yeah. Oh, transaction <laughs> fees are going to create consensus instability? Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. That, I mean, that shows how early we are, right? Nobody's talking nowadays about how the internet works, right? Because everybody's just using it. So, but we still have to talk about how blockchains work and DLT and the whole space and cryptocurrencies and token economics, which is something that we're also going to be talking about in a minute. Um, but let's uh, switch the topic over to um, the interoperability side of, of Cosmos, right? Cosmos is promised to be the internet of blockchains and actually that vision has already been kind of shipped and delivered, right? I mean, we're actually seeing yeah. that IBC, um, the inter-blockchain communication protocol, which is kind of the TCPIP standard for the blockchain economy, was shipped in February uh, this year. And now, especially with Osmosis, which is an uh, automated market maker um, that runs on its own chain, sovereign chain, um, with its own validator network, but it's still compatible to the Cosmos Hub and other chains in the Cosmos ecosystem. So can you briefly explain um, the, the IBC and also your involvement in it? And then also after that, we're going to talk about the, the gravity bridge and where we stand with that one. Yeah, let's talk about all those pieces. So, you know, it was it, it was interesting, right? It was like, so what, what are the things that we, we knew back in 2016? So in 2015 and 2016, um, we knew that the EVM wasn't scalable. The Ethereum virtual machine was not scalable. Um, so we knew that you needed multiple blockchains. Um, we also knew that like everyone was like talking about sharded blockchains. At the time. Um, and we also knew that this like the kind of design ideas that Solana ended up going down um, uh, uh, ended up implementing kind of existed. Like you could make a, a blockchain with essentially like huge blocks. Um, uh, and it was a lot of work to do it, but all of those systems run into run into limits. And we wanted to build, I think the biggest, the big vision of, of IBC was what if you build a system that actually has no limits, like truly has no limits. Mm -hmm. Um, the, and so one of the questions came, so the problem that every sharded blockchain had was, hey, I want to have multiple blockchains. I want to have a multi-chain environment because, you know, here are the limitations around scaling a single chain. But then I want, uh, I want uniform security. I want every blockchain to be secure. And uh, unto itself. And it's like, okay, so you do this and now it comes with all these trade-offs. Um, uh, it comes up with these trade-offs. You have this, you've complicated committee selection mechanisms, complicated mechanisms for, uh, for shuttling state between validator nodes. Like you get all this incidental complexity um, and all of those systems don't truly result in a system that doesn't have any limits um, in, in scale. So what if, Instead, you build a system that was um, designed to isolate failure, i.e. A, uh, uh, a blockchain could fail in the system and the system would still make sense. Mm. Um, so that really led us to the design of IBC. And the design of IBC is really, we don't, this, this idea of sovereignty has like all of these really compelling uh, aspects of it, you know, you, people can issue their own tokens. It's sort of this great environment for entrepreneurs. But as a system, it really gets down to the point of this is a system that tolerates the failure of any individual component. Um, the uh, uh, osmosis can run, osmosis can have bugs, it can halt, it could uh, 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 have inflation. Uh, uh, it could, in, you know, inflate to infinity, the pools could fail. And the Cosmos Hub, you know, I, people who have, you know, millions of dollars of atoms and, and osmosis pools would lose money. Um, but the Cosmos Hub would continue and the IBC network would be fine. Um, and so what the real uniqueness of what we were trying to build with IBC is, and the, like, it is utterly unique today in this space, is we have built really the only protocol that can survive the failure of a blockchain network. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think is really special. Um, 
And as a result, you get, as a result of being able to tolerate failure, you get sort of infinite, the potential for infinite growth. Um, if you think, you know, to go back to use a very Ethan uh, 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 metaphor, if you think about like uh, an organism, you know, like a, a, a body, um, uh, like uh, the human body, you know, you get sick, you recover, you, your cells are, are, you know, growing, dividing, getting cancer all the time, you know, and you're, 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 you know, mutating, failing, and the system continues. Um, and the system continues for a very long time. Um, and if you look at the blockchain systems that exist today, they don't have this property. Um, they are very, very vulnerable to the failure of individual components. You know, the get developers make like one mistake and, you know, a multi hundred billion dollar economy just collapses. Um, mm -hmm. And we really wanted to build something that wasn't like that. Um, and IBC is the only thing that isn't like that in the blockchain space. Um, and so that has been, that's really been the joy of, of IBC. And, you know, the question has been, what does IBC go to market look like? Um, and I think IBC go to market has kind of been like a real mystery for a lot of people. Um, and I think Sonny and Dave, they're geniuses. So, you know, it's not surprising to me at all. Sonny, Dave, and Josh, like they were some of the smartest people that I recruited into Cosmos. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, they, they really solved it by, you know, doing the logical thing, which is setting up a farm that you have to use IBC to farm. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, it's, it, it's that simple, right? Um, and, uh, and they did it in osmosis is beautiful and wonderful. And it's the, the user experience is incredible. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I mean, that was, that was the other thing that people like really just like didn't, uh, uh, and like the IBC user experience is still, it's still like, it's still terrible compared to what it could be or what it will be. Right. Because the biggest problem, well, probably the biggest gap in the IBC user experience is we've always envisioned that users would be able to relay their own packets. Mm. Um, like if they didn't, if no one else, because that was the whole point of having relayering being permissionless. Mm. Um, and right now you still have this problem, you know, some small percentage of packets get stuck. Um, and it's great. Like the protocol is correctly designed. No one loses money. You get your money back. Um, and so that's fantastic. It's much better than many other uh, bridge systems. Um, but if users could relay their own packets, then they, then like, you know, oh, my packet hasn't been relayed. I'll just relay it myself. Um, so, you know, it's, it's still, it's still a lot of work to be done. Um, but like, yeah, I think osmosis has really demonstrated how great the IBC user experience can be. Uh, and so many people doubt, it. um, in, in the blockchain protocol design pe space, people were just like, you can build us, you, you can build all this IBC stuff. The user experience will be terrible. The latency will be too too bad for anyone to tolerate. Nobody will want to use these systems. And I think Osmosis has been like a real demonstration that like no, the the latency is perfectly acceptable. It is, yeah. And uh, I've I'm I'm a daily user. I mean, I love it. And um, a lot of my yeah, no. As an Osmosis valid, you know, we were we we inclusion was actually having this problem, which was uh, so at 10 a.m. is the epoch. 10 a.m. Pacific time is the epoch change here. And I would like, and we would go down, I would notice that we kept going down at 10 a.m. And I was like, okay, like I, ah, it's the epoch change. And you know, it's that that epoch, the, the 10 a.m. epoch change, plus the next like hour or two, when everyone logs on and like, you know, updates their 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 farming uh, with their rewards. Mm -hmm. There's just like so much load on that network, but we, we, yeah. we upgraded the, uh, we upgraded the, uh, the capacity of the node and and, right. and that's been running pretty smoothly. Yeah, there was I think there was this proposal in the first week um, when there was they were running out of uh, space and then they increased the capacity. And also I think a couple of IBC transactions have also been stuck, like you were mentioning about the the relayers. But it yeah. also shows like, I mean IBC works definitely. It also works under real world circumstances, right? When everybody wants to FOMO into something, and uh, osmosis I think they have. In the first month, around thirty thousand active users, which is crazy. Um, so it shows that it works, but it also points out like where where is like small things that need to be readjusted and, yeah. and made. But better. like like I said, I really I really really like. You know, I mean, I've had I've had IBC packets with tens of thousands of dollars of, of, of atoms get stuck. Um, and, you know, it's just like, but there's no fear, right? You just like, you know, they're like, you know, it'll, it'll, 
get one of the relayer operators to restart their Hermes instance and your packet will get timed out and you just send it again, right? Um, and like that ability to sort of ape without fear uh, <laughs> uh, is, is, is fear, kind right? of what, what IBC is all about. Um, and and that, that was a big part of the, the value proposition of, of Cosmos. Um, okay. Is 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 the sort of ape without fear uh, uh, methodology? Yeah, I, I we 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 envisioned right, like we envisioned. I envisioned that like you know people are going to send their IBC packets to you know random blockchains that are running in someone's basement. Uh, it'll happen. Yeah, it's true. I mean, yeah, that's how it is. Um, so so can you differentiate to uh, what IBC is compared to the Gravity Bridge, and also talk a little bit about the Gravity Bridge? Um, who is working on it? How far is it? When can we expect something, you know, tangible yeah, to use? Absolutely. So um, when we built Conceived Cosmos, and you go back all the way to the original white paper and all uh, uh, back at the day, you know, we, we conceived of IBC as this really amazing protocol, but we knew that there was, we, we, we knew that the theory, we really thought that Ethereum would, was going to you know stand the test of time, um, and Ethereum was the big gap. It was like, and like when Ethereum proof of stake was going to happen, and when when Ethereum was going to start sort of solving its design problems, always unclear. And so the one sort of thing that we did not have a really great, we knew that like sort of native IBC for Solidity was always going to be like really like for Ethereum was going to be a big challenge. Right. Um, so we 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 wanted to do um, bridges, and I guess the other thing that was obvious and foreseeable was that in a world where there are many chains, in the world where Ethereum has a lot of value on it, um, without a doubt, there was people were going to build centralized bridges. Mm -hmm. um, whether you go all the way to like WBTC um, and Wrapped.com and just sort of pure custodial KYC solutions all the way to, so you have the spectrum. So you basically have the spectrum. On one side of the spectrum is IBC. Native consensus integration, totally trustless relayers, ape, with, ape without fear. Um, on, the, on the other side of that spectrum, you have RAP.com and WBTC, where it's like, you put your tokens into like a bank somewhere, and they give you a, 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 a wrapped token on another chain. So this is the this is the spectrum. In a world where these two things exist, the middle was obviously going to get filled out. Um, and so you have um, the wormhole bridge from Certus One, who was like one of the earliest Cosmos validators, um, is being used as a, a bridge technology by quite a few technology company organizations. Um, you have um, MPC ECDSA based bridges like uh, uh, what Thorchain is doing and what Keep is doing and what Axelar is doing. Um, uh, and those are more on the decentralized spectrum. What, um, what, what gravity is, and so gravity is what we think is a good bridge design for the Cosmos stuff, i.e. it's not, it, the whole validator set participates in it. Um, mm -hmm. It, in its initial version, doesn't use any crazy cryptography. Um, it's um, a pretty simple and easily understandable, easily extensible system. Um, but you know, it's much more complicated than um, than than the than the than the traditional bridges. And you know, the focus of the sort of core Cosmos team up until the launch of IBC was like, we have to ship proof of stake, we have to ship IBC. These are our missions. The, this bridge is a nice to have thing. So it was always some external team um, that has historically been working on it. Um, and so last year I, I published this memo called Adam 2021, which was I thought what, what the focus should be, what, well, what should we, we focus on um, after IBC launched? Um, there are basically three things there. One was you should have a DEX, you should have DEXs in the ecosystem, you should have a DEX on the Cosmos Hub. Um, and so that turned into the Gravity Dex product project. Um, we should have an Ethereum bridge. So that that got us to the um, that got us to the uh, that got us to the uh, what, the work on the Gravity Bridge. And we should have staking derivatives. Those were my three things. So where are we on the Gravity Bridge? 
I think what very few people know is that you're going to start seeing blockchains probably within the next week or two, um, starting to go live running the Gravity Bridge software. Um, the Gravity Bridge instances have been running in testnet for, for quite some time now. Um, probably the most unfortunate thing right now is we basically have three forks of the Gravity Bridge. We have the sommelier fork of the Gravity Bridge. We have the injective protocol fork of the Gravity Bridge. And then we have the Altia uh, fork of the Gravity Bridge. Um, the advantage of it has been that like a lot of people have been working on it. There are a lot of eyes on the protocol. Um, but somehow there's to get to the Cosmos Hub, we're going to have to unify this work. But uh, Injective just finished their audits um, with Informal. Uh, they're going to go live like sort of any day now. Sommelier, we are finishing up uh, sort of an initial mainnet launch um, of what we're building on Sommelier using the Gravity Bridge technology. I think so at very least these two efforts are going to sort of uh, uh, bear fruit into live mainnets very shortly. Um, and so you're going to see, you know, uh, more and more bridges to Ethereum mobile sub, the SIF chain bridge, um, which is based on sort of an earlier version of this work, um, but that's also going to go live. Um, and so bridges are going to start propping up and we're going to take all of the learning from all of this and, 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 and make a proposal to the Cosmos Hub to have a Cosmos Hub native bridge um, sort of based on all of this work. But that's, that's where all of this has been driving towards. But basically, you know, into the Cosmos DeFi ecosystem, you know, we're basically like maybe a few weeks away from, from having like a significant presence of, of, of Ethereum assets coming into the ecosystem. That's awesome. I didn't even know that. I mean, um, and we were talking about this before recording this. Um, and uh, I was also surprised to hear now how far it actually is. And also, I think the approach is really good that you first launch it uh, on multiple chains, maybe even with different flavors, have different code audits from different third parties as well. Hopefully we see more of that. Um, and then propose something to implement natively on the Cosmos Hub. I think um, that's a bit of a similar approach, I guess, how Gravity Dex um, was implemented. Um, also, we had this uh, testnet competition, then there was, I think, two code audits. Then you obviously have first-hand user experience with, with Osmosis now that is running for one month and seven days or eight days now for um, on Osmosis. So that's pretty cool. Um, and yeah, I mean, so you said there's three elements on the on the uh, on this Adam 2021 um, memo that you published: um, the bridge um, and also the the staking derivatives part. So can you talk a little bit about that? Uh, is that coming natively on the hub as well, or what's the roadmap? Yeah. Here? So uh, we have. I've been talking about staking derivatives for a year, um, and our friends over at. Uh, uh, Lido, and you know, if you think about what Lido is, Lido is basically the the OG Cosmos Hub validator set, um, uh, bringing decentralized staking to the Ethereum and other staking uses. They've really gone forward and made a lot of work, um, a lot of stuff happen on a lot of on a number of different blockchains: Ethereum, Solana, uh, Terra, uh, with with getting staking derivatives out into the world. And staking derivatives are clearly a product market fit. Uh, there's there's a there's a blog post from from Lido sort of outlining their journey on staking derivatives that's coming out like any day now. But so like I have a domain uh, liquidstaking.com. Um, I have a Telegram group um, that uh, uh, we just we just brought on board a contractor um, to help sort of take some of those ideas and and turn them into code. Marco from the Tendermint team, uh, the Tendermint core dev team, has, has done this amazing job of implementing epoch-based staking. So one of the things that has happened, one of the decisions we made in Cosmos early was we were going to have the validator set be able to change every block. Um, and we were like, this is really good. It makes uh, staking feel very permissionless. Um, you know, you know, anyone who can stake their stake, get into the validation set every block. It also makes things really hard. Um, <laughs> like, uh, uh, and almost every other proof of stake protocol other than Cosmos has done, uh, uh, you know, had, has done what are called epochs, which is like the validator set for some, you know, four, six, 12, 24 hours uh, is fixed. If you stake, you get into the next epoch. Mm -hmm. And if you have epochs, then it's really easy to build staking derivatives on top of it. And if you don't have epochs, it's like you have to do all these hacky things. Um, 
And so Marco has this has this pull request that's open on the Cosmos SDK implementing staking, uh, epoch-based staking. Once you have epoch-based staking, then staking derivatives become really easy to, to implement. Um, what I think one of the key things that people don't understand is that once we do staking derivatives, then we can really start to rebuild, really change the, uh, uh, the atom minting and inflation schedule. Um, staking derivatives are the bar. Um, because in a world without staking derivatives, we have this problem, which is eventually, you know, I, whether it's the gravity decks and, or osmosis or like the next five farms, someone is going to come up with something that like is going to provide incentives for atoms that are actually going to create downward pressure on the, on the amount of staked atoms. Um, because people are like, I want to ape into that. I don't have, I, I can't, uh, uh, and all my atoms are staked. I need to unstake in order to, 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 to make this stuff happen. The, um, and so we need a variable rate of atom emission um, and it needs to be you know, APY driven uh, in order to ensure that Cosmos Hub remains secure in a world where someone, can, where someone is gonna come along and be like, you know what, screw it, you know, huge incentives, bring all your atoms. Um, and so, you know, this is why, this is what drives the current economic design of the Cosmos Hub. But once we have staking derivatives, once people can take their derivatives um, and ape with those, um, and the atoms remain staked on the Cosmos Hub, um, then we're really free to start, you know, uh, looking at moving to fixed atom issuance. Um, so there's only, a, you know, we can, we can issue like, you know, some million number of million atoms per year, um, and it no longer has to be percentage based. We can remove this sort of um, staking targeted APY mechanism probably pretty safely once we have a staking derivatives mechanism. Um, and so, you know, staking derivatives are coming to the Cosmos Hub, have already come to the Cosmos Hub with stuff like persistence and P-stake. Um, but the goal of liquidstaking.com, the goal of the working group is every atom holder should be able to send a transaction. We should do an upgrade to the Cosmos Hub that every atom holder should be able to send a transaction and get a staking derivative for their staked atoms without having to unstake, without having to change validators, without having to do anything else. Um, and so that's, 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 I think, like one of the most important areas of work. Um, and so we're, uh, you know, uh, I'm doing that, I'm doing sommelier. Uh, those, those, are, those are some of my bigger projects. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, I think, um with the rise of DeFi also, you're going to see more demand, market demand uh, for staking derivatives. Like you were saying, there's going to be farms that offer high APYs, high yields. So people FOMO un unstake um, just because they want to, you know, put their atoms to work somewhere else. But then you sacrifice the security of it, right? So for yeah. those who don't know what staking derivatives actually is, it's basically a tokenized version of your staked atoms or your staked whatever token, right? And um it's, it adds so much more utility um, and it ensures the security of, of the respective chain that is um, running a, a upon. But uh, yeah, so that's that's really interesting. And I'm uh, also a big fan also uh, what Persistence is doing. Um, I think they are one of the first ones. Then you have uh, Stuffy or, or Stayfy. I don't know how you pronounce them. Stuffy, they're also doing something similar. Um, uh, and I think also eventually competition is great, right? You have different ways and, and different uh, approaches and flavors to it. Um, but uh, it, and you gain experience along the way, so I think that's also super important, um, especially in a running ecosystem that already has billions of dollars in it, right? Uh, which is what Cosmos. Yep. Um, so you already talked about the atom economics, and I think um, just a brief context again for everybody who is new to that or has probably because there was a video circulating on YouTube of a, of a guy who said he's staying away from Atom because of the tokenomics and the infinite inflation and those kind of things. Um, currently how it is, there's a dynamic inflation of atoms um, between I think seven is the lower end, 7% and 20%, yep. which readjusts itself according to the amount of um, atoms that are staked right, to provide security. So basically, um, when there's not enough atom stakes, uh, the inflation goes up so that users are incentivized to stake their assets to provide security, right? And um, yeah, 
at the same time, of course, a lot of people love, you know, to earn 14% or 15% APY. Currently, I think it's around 10% for staking um, as a side income, right? Obviously, there's a lot of speculation involved as well. Um, and I think the current threshold is, um, or the target threshold is 66%, two thirds yep. of the atom staked to the protocol. So what do you think about this concept? Uh, well, we already figured out that um, you think that it should be uh, <laughs> improved. So what do you think about it? And what would your ideal scenario look like for atoms, tokenomics and inflation and all those kind of things? So, I mean, I think we, you know, I think the 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 um, the uh, uh, I think that so here here are my 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 general thoughts on it. One is I think it should be changed. I think absolutely it should be changed. Um, I also think we have the reality of it, the situation is we probably have one we have like probably one chance in like let's say the next year or two. Um, to kind of shoot your shot, our shot on 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 changing atom economics. So we should probably do it like sort of with like one big theory rather than sort of making a bunch of minor tweaks. Um, and uh, you know, because if you make a bunch of minor tweaks, like every time you tweak these things, like you know, you, you have the exchanges that offer exchange staking, like they have to you know update their APYs. Like you're gonna have this sort of cascade of of dependencies, and if you're just making a small change, like okay, I don't want the per, the the AP the 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 inflation to be seven percent. I think it should be six percent or five percent. Cool. Um, like there, there's logical reasons why that might be true. Um, you know, the atom price has doubled um, uh, from sort of where it has been historically. Maybe we should maybe we should lower inflation. Great. But like you think about all of the dependencies and the communications and the politics and you know, validators who are, who are, who have, you know, made hiring decisions and whatnot based in adjusted salaries based on, uh, uh, and like, it's sort of a mess. So let's do this. My, my point of view is let's ship staking derivatives and let's use the opportunity of shipping staking derivatives to move to a fixed issuance target rather than a percentage based target. Um, and that I think would be a real opportunity, uh, 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 sort of the best use of like sort of shooting that shot. Um, and so that would already, instead of, you know, infinite inflation, infinite and constantly increasing issuance, um, it would go to steady issuance uh, in, a, in a staking derivative world. Um, and I think that would be, I think that would be fine. Uh, and then, and then we can talk about with the community about, you know, lowering that issuance over time. Um, I mostly am of the opinion, you know, the general point of view of, of, of whether it's Cosmos or Ethereum uh, or, you know, the Cosmos stuff is we are, what we are committed to is a useful network, um, a secure and useful network. We are not primarily introduced, interested in building like a meme asset. Um, and so the economics of atoms will be determined by like the best economics that can produce a secure system. Uh, not, uh, not you know, uh, uh, the the uh, the fat uh, the fat of it. The other thing that I think uh, would probably go into the atom thing is, if the gravity dex is successful, I can really think we should we, we can we can either introduce a burn or a redistribution of of fees from the gravity dex into the community pool. Um, both of those are possible, um, I think, and both of those are possible and appropriate. Um, and aligned with soft, with development that we want to do in the Cosmos SDK. I think Ethan has already talked about this um, when I interviewed him, that there's some some research going on and work going on with EIP 1559-like implementations where you burn a base of the transaction fees. To yeah, and so I would like to do that. I, I especially would like to do that for gravity tax transactions. I would like to have either like have, have like a variable burn or a burn or move sending trend tokens to the community pool from uh, from interactions with the gravity decks, but we need a we need a UI for the gravity decks. We need success for the gravity decks. All of that has to happen. Um, let, let, I really think e the reason why EIP fifteen fifty nine can happen on Ethereum, the reason why it's it 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 makes sense, is because you know there's essentially twenty five percent of every Ethereum block is Uniswap transactions. Mm. 
Um, I think the, the the logic of EIP fifteen fifty nine and the logic uh, and the success of AMMs on Ethereum. And so one of the things we can do on Cosmos is rather than having EIP fifteen fifty nine only for um, EIP fifteen fifty nine only for for every transaction, you know, bank sends governance proposals, whatever we can, you know, gravity stuff like which would be a mess. We can be like, no, we are going to have EIP fifteen fifty nine, but just for gravity based transactions. Right. Yeah. Would make sense, yeah. And, and let's wrap things up with um, with final thoughts on Gravity Dex. Now that we're talking about it, um, and also Emeris, which is the front end that everybody is highly anticipating to come out. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on it? And um, yeah, what are you expecting is going to happen? Um, though, so I saw last night that there was the first trade on Gravity Dex. Somebody, somebody did a trade. Um, I kind of like, I, I, I'd honestly be a little bit happier if there was uh, probably the biggest thing I've been thinking about recently is the need for like sort of a, uh, a sort of community UI to the Gravity Dex in addition to Emirates. Um, I think we've seen with like, for instance, the Uniswap uh, censoring some tokens from the, and like all those tokens that, uh, 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 you know, a big chunk of those tokens that uh, 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 um The, the mirror tokens that were censored by Uniswap were uh, were also you know are Cosmos native tokens. The, they come from from the Terra blockchain, um, and so I think these challenges. I think like one of the things that I think we need to figure out for uh, for for the Gravity Dex is to have Emrys and community driven UIs um, start up, sort of start to come out, and I think that would probably be a good thing for us to fund through the community pool as a community driven UI. Um, But like, let's let Emirates come out. I don't think this will be a problem in the immediate future. Um, but uh, I do think I do think the other thing is, is you know this whole credible neutrality discussion with with osmosis. I just have felt that what we've learned is just like just like proof of stake is an essential functionality of a blockchain. Um, price discovery is an essential functionality of a blockchain ecosystem, um, and it's really good that we have. All these DEXs launching on Cosmos, SIF chain, Osmosis, you know, Terra's various DEXs, Terra swap and uh, uh, their stable swap implementation. Like so many DEXs are launching. This is wonderful. But I think having a baseline DEX on the Cosmos hub is essential um, uh, to the success of the interchain, that there should be a DEX on the Cosmos hub uh, because it is such essential functionality to the ecosystem. And we can't depend on something else. Makes sense. Yeah, um, that's awesome. I mean, that's another hour that went by flying and uh, we learned so much. I learned so much, especially about the bridge and the gravity um, progress there. So thank you so much for your time. Um, incredible what you're all involved in so many projects. Uh, maybe we can catch up another time to talk exclusively about Sommelier, for example. That's one project I'm also really, really excited about. Um, but yeah, thanks again for your time. Um, let's keep in touch and I wish you all the best, man. Fantastic. It was great talking to you. Uh, keep keep going. Yeah, man. Thank you for the content. Thanks.